Welcome again. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm Andrew, the preacher here. Uh, and as we begin this morning, we're going to ask some similar questions. You might have heard these before if you've been coming recently. Uh, what's that? Well done. <clears throat> what's that? A circle. Can a line be a circle? Can a circle be a line? I mean, a straight line? No. They're two different things, right? So <clears throat> you're either with Jesus or you're against him. Plain as, plain as day, right? Except last week we said that you could be not exactly with Jesus, but like welcome people that he sent, and then you'll get the same reward as they get. And that seems a little strange, doesn't it? But this week, you've just heard the scripture read that said, well, if you're not with me, you're against me. Well, this is confusing. <laughs> we, we would like it all to be very simple. Ones and zeros, right? Just as simple as possible. So today, we're going to help to clear this mess up a little bit by asking the question, are you with Jesus? And walking through these scriptures to see what Jesus would have us do and why, <clears throat> he kind of seems to change his tune in this passage versus the uh, ones we shared last week. So this is in our, our sermon, series called, sermon series called Lines We Draw. And the whole idea is that we draw lines uh, that keep people out, that keep people in, um, lines of boundaries that we say, this is as far as I can go and I can't go no further. And, um, and sometimes those are healthy, but sometimes they're not so healthy. Sometimes they're culturally made and sometimes they're um, made by Christ, you might say. And it's important for us to know the difference. And so today is another one of those sermons in this series that helps us to see that maybe... Maybe there's a reason for the way that we think and behave that would be healthier to follow Jesus' model than our own. So um, love is our, our theme for the year, and we're asking all these questions in learning to love God, love ourselves, and to love our neighbor better. Let's pray as we begin. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for an opportunity to come, to hear your word, to, to open our hearts. God, may you open our hearts. May we see it with new eyes, with new ears, hearing what you have to say through me and through the others that are speaking today. God, may we also hear those in our past and in our future calling out to us, encouraging us to listen to what you have to say, God. May we all hear well, including me, that we hear your message. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so in Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 through 37, that's where our text is. That's where our story is. It's an interesting story. It's a story in the middle of fights with the Pharisees, you might say. Jesus is being challenged. The Pharisees keep coming to him and trying to put him on edge to, you know, mess him up, to derail his ministry because they don't like him. <laughs> it's that simple. The Pharisees are losing ground. Jesus is gaining ground. More people are following Jesus than are following the Pharisees. And they're losing more and more. And you see, the Pharisees had a position to protect. They had a, a place of prominence. People liked them. They were known as the, the right people, the people who do good, the people who teach and who you should obey. And Jesus comes along and upends a lot of their teachings. And he, well, they don't like it. And Jesus is thinking, well, this is the way it should be. And so there's a struggle. And this is in the middle of that struggle that this story comes. So then they brought him. So see, it was already going on. And they said, look, let's bring somebody to Jesus. They brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. And Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? And well, that's a good question, isn't it? Could this be the son of David? Meaning, could this be the Messiah? Could this be the chosen one? Could this be the king we're waiting for who's going to destroy Rome and set us free from the tyrannical government, right? Um, but the other is here that we look at this and we go, demon-possessed? Can people really be demon-possessed? Well, throughout the scriptures, there's this talk of demon possession, and it seems to be real because Jesus addresses it, and he heals people who have demons and say, yes, this is a demon, this is legion. This is really bad. This person has more than one demon, multiple demons in them. Now, other times we say, well, maybe this person was just, you know, blind and mute. Well, could a demon cause you to be blind and mute? Sure. But some people throughout the ages have said, every sin and sickness has a demon attached to it. That's not necessarily true because other parts of Scripture say, ah, if you're sick, pray, and God will heal you. 
Ask the elders of the church to anoint you. That's in James chapter 5, and, and you'll, you'll be healed. Well, generally speaking, we would hope that to be true, but it's not every time that we get healing or else there'd be still these crazy stories going on where people walk out of the hospital and they don't die, right? <laughs> we don't hear that so much. So it's not the same kind of miraculous healing that we would hope for, but sometimes God still works like this, right? But, so all the people are asking, is this the son of David? Well... The Pharisees heard this, and they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man drives out demons. This fellow drives out demons. He says, Ah, he's doing it by Satan's power. Because Beelzebul is like Lord of the Flies. You remember that book from middle school, maybe? That's an awful book. And actually, just so you're aware, there were many, uh, not many, there's a story, I should say. There's other stories, too. But one story that I've heard that, that says... Culture won't go to the most evil place every single time, especially when young boys are involved. Because there was a group of young boys that set sail for fun, and they got lost on a deserted island. And you know what happened? A year later, somebody came and found them. They were all fit and healthy and alive, and they didn't devolve into that culture of evil that the Lord of the Flies did, that book, okay? So that was somebody's fanciful imagination running off. The, the average young boys that are well-mannered are, are going to stay well-mannered on a deserted island with nobody around. They're going to learn how to plant crops and take care of themselves and then be rescued a year later. But anyways, or maybe much, much later. But anyways, this, this whole di idea of the, the Satan, the accuser, is Beelzebul, the one who is bad, who is evil. And, and the Pharisees are saying he's doing it by that power because, well, we don't like him, and he can't be doing it by the power of God because if he does it by the power of God, then we have to listen to him, and we don't want to listen to him. So it's by Satan that he's doing this. Jesus knew their thoughts because he didn't hear them directly, but it was a murmur going through the crowd. But he also knew what they were thinking, and he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. What kind of division are we talking about? Does this division mean that you and I don't agree on the color of the carpet? Or does this division mean something more like we don't agree on who God is? And really and truly, it's, it's the, the latter. Who is God? That's the bigger issue here. Who is God? Who is Satan? And, and who's following him? That's really where this is at. So... Every household divided against itself will not stand. Now, you might have heard this in history that somebody used this in a speech. And while many politicians have used this in speeches, because back in the day, most of our politicians were very familiar with Scripture because everybody in the culture was. And so they would pull out a verse or a little passage or a little idea, and they would plant that in their, in their talk, and people would go, Oh! And it was Abraham Lincoln who talked about this. And he, he, he said, a, a, a nation divided against itself will not stand. We have to decide, are we pro-slavery or against slavery? And since then, people have used all kinds of scriptures to justify their political leaning. And, yeah, interesting, though. <clears throat> 26, if Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And that's the other issue, that if you're at war with yourself... I mean, that's essentially, Jesus is going around healing everybody, everywhere. He's, he's casting out demons. He's doing amazing things, and he's proclaiming it's all by the word of God. That this is God speaking to him, saying, do these things, and therefore his authority is directly from his father, he says, God, right? And they're saying, no, 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 it's by Satan. Well, why would Satan want to cast out demons to make it look like, you know, Jesus is a good guy, doing good stuff? because he's dividing against himself and he's destroying himself. It'd be kind of like you going into your house and saying, you know, this is a nice house, I really like it, but I'm just going to tear out this wall and not rebuild it. I'm going to destroy half my house. N nobody does that. Nobody thinks that way unless they're going, I'm going to remodel. But Satan doesn't usually remodel, let's just put it that way. And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So then, they will be your judges. Now, apparently, there were people who were able to drive out demons who weren't Jesus because they were also on God's side. They were prophets or, um, in some way, uh, healers. And so they could, by the power of God, cast out demons. Jesus gives them credit here and says they can do it. And it's interesting that he refers his accusers to go back to their own people and say, who, who are they doing it by? 
What authority do they have to drive out demons? Maybe you should talk to them. Because we're both doing the same activity. Wouldn't it make sense that it's by the same authority? Because Satan's not going to attack himself. That wouldn't make any sense. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And, and that's the issue. Now, other passages where it tells the same story or stories like it talk about the kingdom of God, the Spirit of God, the finger of God, that this is God at work. And it's the whole idea that if what Jesus is doing is real, true, good, from God, then you can't stop this. And this is the kingdom of God come on earth. And that's upsetting for multiple reasons for these people, the Pharisees, because they're losing power. They're recognizing their teachings aren't true. That they've been teaching things and living in ways that are inappropriate. And now they have to repent and follow this other guy who is not one of theirs. They didn't choose him. He didn't rise up through their ranks. He's not somebody that is on their team, so to speak. So, you know, they don't want him. And they don't want his kingdom. They don't want what he's presenting. And yet Jesus is saying, no, 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 this is, this is it. I'm, I'm the Messiah, I'm, I'm the one, I'm here for you, but you need to choose me, right? Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Well, what's that talking about? Is Satan the strong man? And that's exactly what Jesus is saying. Satan is the strong man. So then the question becomes, when did Jesus tie up Satan? Do you know? When did Jesus tie up Satan? When did he say, Satan, you got nothing on me? Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. You remember Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. He had three temptations. And they're the common temptations. Power, fame, um, filling their belly, right? I mean, being, being respected and worshipped. The shortcuts of life. Getting around the hard choices and the hard struggles. And Jesus says, no, 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 Satan. Get behind me. I'll have nothing to do with you. You cannot tempt me. And in that, he bound Satan. He said, you, you've got no power over me. You cannot tempt me. And so, from then on, his ministry begins. And he goes out doing miraculous things. And then he says, back in Matthew 12, 22 through 37, in verse 30, it says, Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. But this is in direct relationship to are you accusing me of being on Satan's side? Are you saying that the power I have is from evil? <laughs> then you, you're not with me. You're not for me. You're accusing. You're attacking. So in this case, Jesus is saying, you're obviously not for me. You're, you're opposed. So Luke chapter 9, verses 49 through 50 was last week. Master, he said, uh, said John, that is. We see someone driving out demons in your name, and we try to stop him because he is not one of us. Oh, do not stop him. Forever is not against you, is for you. So, in today's parlance, in today's words, in today's understanding, if a church down the road is doing good works, and they don't have our name, and they don't do it the way we do it, should we go down there and tell them to knock it off? <laughs> no! We should not, because they love Jesus, they worship Jesus, and they honor Jesus, and they say, we are for Jesus, we're on his side. So, in that sense, we should not tell them to stop. Instead, maybe we should find a way to work with them for the sake of God's kingdom. Because we won't all agree on everything, and in fact, in our very room, this room, there are many of you who agree on certain things, but not on others. Some of you are on this side of an issue and some on that side of an issue. So it's not an issue of everybody has to be exactly the same in every single thought. The issue overwhelmingly is, are you for Jesus or are you against him? That's the biggest question of all. Do you love Jesus and do you respect and honor those who also love Jesus and do works in his name? Now that's sometimes a struggle for people, right? So... <clears throat> And so, I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven. Everything? Yes, except blasphemy. Against the Spirit will not be forgiven. So, right there, when you say, well, they're sinful, <laughs> are we better? <laughs> the church down the road. You know, they do things in a way that we don't approve of. Hold on. Are we better? Do, do we do everything perfect? I would, I would argue we don't. I would argue somewhere along the way, we do something that isn't just right. And I mean, we start our worship saying, God, defeat us if we're wrong. 
But at the same time, we have culture and tradition that we've established, and, and we have it for a long time, and we don't want to move from it. And, and in some ways, it's good, but in what ways might it not be good? Do we know? Are we open to see that? What if Jesus came today and said, hey, I want you to change this? Would we go, Jesus, we're not comfortable about that because we've always done it this way. That's what the Pharisees are saying. <laughs> and, and we would say, oh, but that doesn't seem right to us, Jesus. We've always done it this way. This is, the, well, in my lifetime at least. And then if you go back and study the history of our, our, our churches, and you go back and study the history of the, the greater church, you can see that it's been done many ways in, 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 in various times. And, and, and it's a cultural issue that over generations it changes and it morphs and it's different. So I think the idea here is overwhelmingly that we need to be gracious to people who we disagree with about things that aren't Jesus. <laughs> but we need to be really firm on Jesus. Because Jesus is what unites us. Not that you agree with me about the color of the carpet or exactly whether the communion should be um, served in little cups or one cup or, or whether it should be wine or not wine. All of that is not as important as do you love Jesus? Jesus is the center of our faith. Not the Bible and not what translation you use. Not the interpretation of a certain scripture. It is overwhelmingly Jesus is at the core of our faith. We are called Christians because we follow Christ. He is the Messiah, right? So the difficulty here is this blasphemy thing. And the blasphemy is against the, the Spirit. You know, if you, if you say negative words against the Holy Spirit, then you're toast. I mean, that's essentially it, right? You're done. You've got no hope if you say something negative about the Holy Spirit. What does that mean exactly? Well, well, and why? Why is that? What, how does that work? Well, anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. Well, that's nice. You can speak all you want nasty of Jesus. <laughs> that's what it says. That's strange. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Why is that? What, what's the specialty about the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit is the one who, on whom Jesus depends. Jesus' entire life as a human, as a man, as, well, he is the son of God, but there's this dual nature to him, right? He's the son of God, God, but he's also a human man. And remember that passage, I think it was in Philippians chapter 2, it says, he gave up everything that heaven had to offer and came to earth and became as a, a man, as a slave, as a human. He came to be one of us to help us see you too can live a life worthy of God. And that he really wants you to also know that you can be forgiven because he has defeated Satan and sin and death. And he's come out the other side and said, look, life. And he's done that by the power of the Holy Spirit because it's the Spirit that anointed him at his baptism. It's the Spirit who empowered him to speak all the words he spoke and do all the miracles he did. And if you say anything about the Holy Spirit, that's also from John, I think it's chapter 16, verses 8, 9, and 10, that say it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict you and to call you to Christ. And so if you are convicted and called to Christ, yet you say the Holy Spirit, meh, 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 you're going to have some problems because you've just defeated the power which enables you to be forgiven and to live a godly life and to walk with Jesus. So you don't want to do that. You don't want to speak ill of that Spirit. But the other is, let's back up, but the other is the Son of Man, this is Jesus, who's speaking to people who are contemporaries of him, who are right there in front of him, and he's saying to them, I get it. You look at this body and you think you're just a man. Don't think you're the Messiah. You're just a man. You are not the Son of God. You're just a man. You are not. God. Do not call God your father. He is our father. And even then, in the Jewish faith, it's rare to call God father. It's very rare to call God father because that is a special, special designation. So Jesus claiming all of this and saying all of this, he can understand that somebody would go, <laughs> Jesus, we don't know about you. And keep in mind, very soon, he's going to be welcomed into Jerusalem with worship and all kinds of amazing things, but then not too many days later is 
killed on a cross with everyone chanting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. If they can't be forgiven for yelling crucify him, then who's coming to faith? The world was opposed to him at his death. So anyone speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good, or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad, for a tree is recognized by its fruit. And this is saying, in essence, the Holy Spirit is the, the, the life-giving force of that tree. If that tree is good, then it has the Holy Spirit, and it's growing healthy, good fruit. Otherwise, it's bad. You brood of vipers. That's pretty nasty. We wouldn't think that's all that bad, but I mean, a bunch of snakes, they're unclean. They're associated with the Satan in the garden, right? I mean, calling them a whole bunch of them, oh, that's bad. How can you who are evil say anything good and you're nasty people? That's what Jesus is saying. You're a bunch of gross people. Um, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Here you are accusing me of this. Where's that coming from? It's coming from your heart. A good man brings out good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. So, you know, it's kind of like, what comes out of your mouth every day? What, what, are you blessing people or cursing people on a regular basis? When, when somebody cuts you off or does something to you that upsets you, do you immediately fly off the handle and call down curses on them or, or just flat out use nasty words to speak of them or in your heart have all kinds of bitterness towards them? Or do you say, God, forgive them? Maybe they're not in a good mood today. God, help them to think differently of me and of this situation. God, may you bless them and help them to see clearly what's going on and that I was unintentional in this. I didn't do this on purpose. Verse 36, But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they've spoken. Every empty word. What is an empty word? What is an empty word? A word that, well, it's negative, it's harsh, condescending. It's, a, it's, a, it's just talking to talk, maybe. Or it's a, it's a vaporous word. It's a word that doesn't have really any meaning. It's, it's not building up anyone. It's not helping anyone. Hmm. I don't know this, but if every single word I'm going to be judged for... That's a whole lot of words. I do a lot of talking. <laughs> and not just here. I, I generally talk. I'm a talker. If you hang out with me, I'm gonna, we're going to have a conversation, right? And how many of those words are words that didn't need to be said, that are gossip, slander, negative? How many of those words are, are unkind, unloving? How many of those words are, are void of life and the spirit of God? That's, that's a good question to ask on a regular basis. Are my words God's words? Are they motivated by the Holy Spirit? Are the words that come out of my mouth, are they good, godly, holy? That's, that's a challenging message there. I don't know. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. That's, that's a powerful scripture right there. That's a powerful idea. Think about this. You don't want me to judge you, right? And I don't want you to judge me. I want God to judge me. What if God used the Ten Commandments to judge us? Like, eh, okay, what if we use the Sermon on the Mount because that's kind of the Ten Commandments updated by Jesus. Well, that's a good, I like that. That's a good option. But what about this? You know, my standard is different than that. But what if God just uses my standard? When I judge other people and say, what are you doing? Why do you think? And how are you cutting in front of me? And why are you saying that? And how dare you get loud in my face? What if all those times I called out judgments on others, we just turn those right back around to me? <laughs> and God goes, well, you've said all these things in judgment of others. Let's just use those to judge you. Man, I'd fail that miserably. How about you? <laughs> I don't live up to my own words. That's pretty, pretty awful, isn't it? I, it puts me in a desperate place. My own words are going to condemn me. Oh, unless my own words are, are speaking the love of God and saying, you know, we all make these mistakes. You know, yes, I've done that. What if, if I'm confessing and if I'm forgiving 
And if I'm extending forgiveness and grace and I'm blessing others, yeah, sure, I mess up sometimes, but, but my overwhelming presentation is one of, God, I'm for you, and I want you to be for me, and God, I'm, I'm for others, and I want, I want you to be for them too. I, I think that would put us in a good place. But, but again, can I save myself? <laughs> no. Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, he's the one who saves us. It's by his words that we have life. And so when my words become his words, that's, that's something powerful, right? So that's the end of the message. Here's the faith challenges, putting it into practice. We're wrapping up on the home stretch. There's three of them, not big, not hard. Just, well, they're hard by challenging the very nature of who we are, I think. But again, you might not agree with me, and you might ask God to give you better ones. Maybe these don't fit you, and that's okay. You can just say, Holy Spirit, I trust you're going to give me something better if Andrew doesn't deliver right now. That's fine by me. One, are you with Jesus? I think the overwhelming text here is, are you on his side? Are you, are you cl- trying to be on Jesus' side, or are you trying to make Jesus come over to your side? The Pharisees are saying, Jesus, get on our side. We're going to keep attacking you until you agree with us and say that we're right. And Jesus is saying, um, you're attacking the wrong person. <laughs> I'm here to save you. So when we attack Jesus or his people, we might ask the question is, are we really with Jesus? Am I really with Jesus? It's a really good question to ask. And the other one is, are you divided? Is there some way that you are dividing the kingdom of God? Is there some way that you are dividing your own home, your church, your family, your workplace? And and I mean this in the sense of, is your greatest allegiance back with Jesus? And are you willing to humble yourself and say, God, whatever you want, it's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about me fighting for what's mine. God, it's about me fighting for what's yours. I want to bless you, God. And I want to bless the people around me. And when we turn in that direction, then we're no longer divided because we recognize, once again, that it's about Jesus. He is the center of everything we are. And if he is the center then whoever loves him is who we want to work with and be with as best we can. Now, that doesn't mean we're not working with other people. It just means they're, they're not as committed to Christ. And so we want to move in that direction and encourage others to move in that direction. Now, number three, how's your fruit? You got some good fruit? You got some good words? You got some good things happening in your life? Are you moving towards Christ and can others see it? Do they look at you and say, ha, that person follows Jesus. How how can I know? You can tell by your words, by your actions, by the way that you um, bless others and and not curse them constantly, by the way you're more generous, by the way you're kind, by the way you're modeling humility and repentance and and forgiveness, by, by the way your life is just lived. People can look at you and go, you've, You've got to be a follower of Jesus. You've got the fruit. And we can also do that with the church down the road. Are, are they making people who, are they helping people love Jesus better? Yeah, we don't agree about a ton of stuff, but do people who worship there, are they growing in their love for Jesus? Are they following Jesus? Then, then maybe they're doing something right. Maybe, maybe we don't agree about a few things, but maybe God will bless them too. And maybe we should pray for their blessing. And maybe we should ask them to pray for our blessing. Maybe we should focus more on Jesus than a whole bunch of other issues out there. And say, is Jesus at the center of your life? And praise God. Let's let's go towards that. Because as we do that, all the other stuff will fall off. So now you know, there they are. One, two, three. Are you with Jesus? Are you divided? How's your fruit? You want to walk it out. You want people to see it. You want people to know it. And you don't want to keep putting up roadblocks for others. You want to make it as easy as possible for people to come to Christ and encourage them to love Jesus more and more. So why don't we pray as Jesus has taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive those in debt to us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Father, as we continue to pray, we ask that you would transform our hearts and our minds into into those of your, your spirit. The words, the ideas, the actions, God, defeat us again where we are not with you. Defeat us where we establish roadblocks and difficulties for others to come to faith. God, let us be a people who are loving and generous and kind and open to helping and encouraging all who claim you. God, we want to be with you on your side. Move us in that direction. And let our lives be full of good, healthy fruit that is meaningful, that is purposeful, that is directed towards blessing and healing and helping, just like real fruit is good for the body. May we be good for others and for this body of Christ gathered here today. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen.